Uh, sermon tonight, Standing in the Power of the Spirit. In Hebrews chapter 11, the inspired writer, he recalls how God had brought great triumphs in this world in the lives of people with faith. He says in Hebrews chapter 11, beginning in verse 32, he says, And what more should I say? For time will fail me to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edges of the sword, were made strong from weakness, became mighty in war, put armies of foreigners to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. So you have this, this great statement of these great triumphs and victories that were given in this world to people of faith. But lest, lest we think that the life of faith is all a bed of roses, he quickly reminds us that faith also brought suffering and the heroic endurance of it. He says in the next verses, but others were tortured, not accepting release that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others received a trial of mockings and whippings and even of chains and prison. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They died by murder of the sword. They went about in sheepskins and in skins of goats, being destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in deserts and mountains and in caves and the holes in the ground. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus begins in Matthew chapter 5 with what are commonly known as the Beatitudes. And the, there are eight Beatitudes proper that run from Matthew chapter 3 down through Matthew chapter, uh, chapter 5 verse 3 down through Matthew chapter 5 verse 10. And the final of those Beatitudes, Matthew 5 verse 10, says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Then in Matthew chapter 5, verses 11 and 12, their commentary or an elaboration on that final beatitude that you see in verse 10. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 11 and 12, he says, Matthew 5, 11 and 12, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and other utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. In elaborating on that final beatitude in, in chapter 5, verse 10, Jesus calls the disciples to rejoice in persecution rather than be intimidated by it. And he mentions three forms of hostility that his followers will experience. They will be reviled or insulted. They will be persecuted, which covers all kinds of assaults on one's livelihood, property, liberty, body, and life. And they'll be lied about and slandered. And in verse 10, he said, he said they're persecuted for righteousness' sake, but here, the basis of hostility toward them, it's broadened to because of me or on account of me. This includes persecution driven by hostility to Christians simply because they identify with or are loyal to Jesus. It refers to the deeper root of the persecution. Jesus said in, I'm afraid to touch this, Jesus said in John chapter 15, Verse 18 to 21, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own, but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. But all these things, but, but all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. So Jesus here, he made that same point 
in Matthew chapter 10, verse 22, telling the disciples there that they will be hated by all for his name's sake. And that's why the Apostle John said in 1 John chapter 3, verse 13, Do not be amazed, brothers, if the world hates you. See, hostility and persecution need not mean that the church is doing something wrong. As so many people seem to think, they try to lay the blame for the world's hostility at the church's feet, claiming it's a reaction to our being too narrow-minded and judgmental. But whatever ammunition we may have handed the world, the truth of the matter is, is that this is a spiritual war. That's why Paul says in Ephesians, he reminds us in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, for our struggle is not against blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the world controlling powers of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. If we were flawless, if we were fully Christ-like as we will be at the consummation of the kingdom, the world would still hate us because it hates our Lord. It hates our Lord and therefore hates us. Jesus continues in John chapter 15 and verse 22 with this enigmatic statement. He says, If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have sinned, but now they have no excuse or perhaps better, no pretext for their sin. Now Jesus obviously doesn't mean that they literally would be sinless if He had not come. On the contrary, their sin... And our sin is the very reason that He came. And that's what Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That's why He came. Rather, what He means, I think, is that if He had not come, the Jewish leader's game of concealing their sin under a pretext of religiosity, under a pretext of pious intentions, could continue as before. If he hadn't come, that cloaking of their sin under all these, you know, this piety, that would go on as before, but his coming laid bare the, their hardness toward God. And thus it revealed, it made clear the true nature of their intention. See, in exposing their hearts as hostile to God, he made clear that any attempt to hide their sin behind pious intentions, to make that and to cloak their sin in piety was just that. It was a mask. It was a pretext for sin. So he laid that bare. He laid their rejection and their dislike of God bare. So when they try to cover their sin with their religiosity, he says, I've blown that away. Now if I hadn't come, you'd have been able to keep doing that. But now that I've come, you can't. The following verses, verses 23 through 35, they confirm that the significance of his coming that he's here focusing on is its, its revealing of the hearts of those who reject him. He says there, whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not have sinned. But now they have seen. They've seen. They have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. See, to be in the presence of Jesus. To be in the presence of God incarnate. Who reveals fully his divinity, his deity, in his words and in his actions. To be in his presence and to reject him, to refuse to believe him, that is a case-closed event. You know, as the saying goes, Jesus isn't on trial, they are. Well, that's certainly what's going on. See, all of their sin cover that they would use, how they could hide their sin and drape it in these claims of piety is laid bare and shown to be nothing but that. Because in seeing God in the flesh, 
who demonstrates who he is and they reject him, they show that their intentions towards God aren't what they claim them to be. So he's laid that bare and exposed that. Then he says in verse 26, he says, When the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. So after telling the disciples that the world hates them and assuring them that they'll be persecuted because the world at bottom hates God as shown undisputedly in its hostility toward Him and its rejection of Him, Jesus now has a word of encouragement. He says the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, the helper or counselor, or paraclete, all different ways that word has been rendered, whom he's going to send from the Father, that he will bear witness about him. In other words, the Spirit will speak in opposition to the world's hostility toward Jesus. The Spirit will counter the world's slander and lies and obfuscations by telling the truth about Jesus. He is, after all, the spirit of truth. So he's going to counter all that. He's going to speak the truth about Jesus into this world. In a world that is hostile and hates, the spirit comes and takes those lies and pierces them with the truth. And that's what's going to happen. In fact, a parakletos, which is the word that's translated helper and those things, in the world of ancient Greece, that was one who spoke up in favor of an accused. Somebody who countered the charges that were being leveled against someone. Now that doesn't exhaust the meaning of that word for John, but that sense is part of the meaning. Now in verse 27, it gives insight into how the spirit of truth that Jesus sends to the disciples how he will bear witness, how he will testify on Jesus' behalf. He says in verse 20, and you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. You also will bear witness. He seems to suggest here that there's a kind of joint effort, you see, in which disciples in the power, in the courage, in the conviction given by the Spirit, will tell the world the truth about Jesus in the face of opposition and in the face of false claims. And I think Acts chapter 5, verse 27 through 32, is instructive in that regard. We see there it says, And when they had brought them, they set them before the council. And the high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charged you not to teach in this name, Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses. Now, this is the noun form of the verb in 1526 and in 1527. What it says, he's going to come and testify about me. Well, this is the noun form. They say, we are witnesses. But then you see, he says, we are witnesses, and so is the Holy Spirit. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. So you see this kind of joint project where Jesus sends the Spirit to them. He will testify, and you will testify. And together, the two of you, you testify in the power and in the conviction and in the courage that the spirit of truth provides. And you tell this world that opposes Jesus the truth about him when it's snarling at you, when it's there and intimidating you and giving you that face. And if we have to obey God, we're witnesses. And so is the Holy Spirit. We're not doing this. On our own. Jesus, Jesus then tells them in, in 16.1. He says, I've said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. See, he's told them all of the things he's been talking about. 
He says, I've told these things to you to keep you from falling away. He's told them what the future holds in terms of hatred and persecution. Well, you say, well, you've told us these things to keep us from falling away. How does that relate to that? You've told us this idea of the world's coming hatred and persecution of us. Well, the way that keeps them from falling away is that when it happens, their faith in Him will be strengthened by the fact His words, His prediction, His prophecy of it will be fulfilled. So when the very things He says will happen come to pass, even though they are threatening and intimidating, you, you will be strengthened in your faith because you will recall that I told you that's how it was going down. I told you that's how it was going down. So I tell you all these things so that you won't fall away. And you notice his comment in verse 4 of chapter 16 in the first part, where after in verses 2 and 3, after elaborating on how and why the believers will mistreat them, he says in John 16, 4, but I've said these things to you that when their hour comes, when they have dominance, when they are ready to jump you, when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. You see, he wants them to recall so that when these things happen, they will then remember just as the Lord said. So what would otherwise be something that would cause them to fall away? He's turning it into a source of reinforcement of their faith by telling them in advance exactly how it was going to play out. And then he has another. He says, all these things I've told you to keep you from falling away. The first is the fact that he's told them about it. But secondly, he's given them the encouragement of knowing that they'll not be standing in their own power when they face a hostile and vicious world. You will not be alone. You will not be standing in your own power. The Spirit will testify through them. As he said in Matthew chapter 10, verse 19 and 20, he said, when they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you're to speak or what you're to say, for, for what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Well, that's good. That'll keep me from falling away. Why? Because I'm not standing naked, standing alone, standing without the power of God behind me in that intimidating situation. I can't tell you what... You know, I'm not a courageous person. When I look at the things that people have endured in life, my only hope is that the Spirit will give me power that I may not dishonor the Lord. And here he's saying that, look, the Spirit will give you strength and will give you power in these situations, in this time. All of this, he says, I said these things, it's intended to help them not fall away. And then he says in the second part of verse 4 of John 16, he says there, I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. You see, he was with you. You say, well, I don't get it. Why didn't you tell us these things in the beginning? Because in the beginning, when I was with you, you did not need to know them because I was the focal point. I was the lightning rod of the world's hostility and rejection of God. I'm there, the Son of God, God incarnate. It's all coming to me. But when I'm gone, that hostility and that hatred and that rejection will fall on you. It will fall on my followers. Then he says in 16, 5 to 7, but now I, I'm going to him who sent me, and none of you ask where are you going, but because I've said these things uh, to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So he informs them that he'll be returning to the Father. But the good news is that part of God's unfolding plan is that after he completes the work of his first coming, after his atoning death and resurrection and ascension, he will send the Holy Spirit to them. The one he said will testify with them to the world, the one who will fill them with power and courage and conviction for their service in God's great cause, for their service in God's revolution. 
So he says, I'm going to go, but the way the plan is, is it's not until I go that I send the Spirit, who I've been telling you is going to empower you this way, and he's going to testify with you about the truth of who I am into this dark world and hostile world. In, in John 16, 8 to 11, he spells out more of what the Spirit will do when he's sent. He says, and when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father, and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. He says in verse 8 of John 16, that when he comes, the Spirit will convict the world regarding three things, sin, righteousness, and judgment. In other words, the Spirit will expose the world's guilt, the world's lie, the world's wrong regarding those three things. He says then in, in 16, 9 through 11, he then elaborates on that work of the Spirit by explaining why the Spirit will do that. By giving reasons the Spirit will show or prove the world guilty concerning those things, sin, righteousness, and judgment. He says in verse 9, the Spirit will lay bare the world's guilt regarding sin because they, those of the world, do not believe in Him, do not believe in Jesus. Those who do not believe in Him, they have to be shown that they remain in the guilt of their sin because they have rejected the only path of forgiveness. See, because they do not believe in Him, for that reason, they have to be shown that their claim to be free of their sin is a lie. You see, that's, that's how the world operates. You don't need Him. You're free from your sin. You don't have to worry about that. Well, it is because of that lie, because they don't believe Him, they have to be shown that they are guilty of that lie with regard to sin. You see, this is something, the message is not only true, it's something that's redemptive. As he says in, in John chapter 8, verse 23 and 24, you are from below, I am from above. I just love it when he talks this way. You know, I mean, it's like, who talks like this? He says, you are from below, I am from above. You are, you are of this world, I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. If you don't believe, I'm the one I'm telling you who I am. If you don't believe that, your guilt for sin remains. Because they do not believe in Him, they must be convicted of their guilt with regard to their sin. They have to be shown that they remain guilty. Not the lie that they spin. That we're okay without Him. That's not the case. Now that message, it's not only the truth, it's redemptive. It's redemptive. It is truth that can, that can pierce the deception that one is right with God despite one's unbelief. That is a truth that can pierce that and it can lead to repentance and God's gift of everlasting life. See, we are disloyal and we resist the Spirit's work when we deny that truth whether to get along in a multicultural society for any other reason, and we become accomplices in the world's delusion and in the world's deception when we deny that truth. Because that is the truth. If you don't believe I'm the one I claim to be, you're going to die in your sin. You're going to remain there. Your guilt will remain. I don't care what story you fabricate that eases your conscience and makes you think you're okay. That's a lie. And the Spirit comes to convict the world regarding that lie. Because Jesus is the truth. Jesus says in verse 10, 
He says in 16 verse 10 that the Spirit will lay bare the world's guilt regarding righteousness. Because He goes to the Father and they will see Him no longer. The world is guilty regarding righteousness because it pushes the lie that one's own righteousness is sufficient for a relationship with God. Deceiving people into believing they can be right with God apart from the forgiveness that is available only in His Son. Now whether one trusts in one's performance for righteousness with God or trusts in some other avenue of forgiveness rather than Christ, it is a lie. And that lie will lead to eternal misery. And the Spirit came, the Spirit of truth came to convict the world of its lie and deception and guilt regarding sin, regarding righteousness, as it spins these kinds of things. The Spirit is sent to do that convicting work because Jesus is no longer here to do it. Jesus, as He walked among us, God incarnate, proclaiming the truth of God, this tremendous beacon of light, well, He's no longer here. He's in heaven. And He has sent His Spirit to empower us, and the Spirit will testify and convict the world of its guilt with regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. And again, this message is not only truth. It's truth. But it's redemptive. In terms of earning a right standing before God, you know that our best works are filthy rags. Right? You, know, you know I understand the, the role of works as an expression of redemption. I know that. But when you talk about in terms of earning your standing before God, basing your righteousness on your performance, in that context the very best thing you've got is filthy rags. You see, in terms of the mercy that we need, Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, we have created in our world all kinds of new works righteousness where we sit here and we reject Jesus Christ, but we say, well, I eat healthy, I exercise, I love animals, I care about the environment, and therefore I'm really a righteous person. And some of the smuggest people in the world are people who think, listen, I'm doing all these great things. But their idea is that that somehow puts me before God. And that's a delusion. The only thing putting you before God is the blood of Jesus. That's it. And so the world needs to be convicted of that. He says in verse 11 that the Spirit... He says that the Spirit will lay bare the world's guilt regarding judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. The world is guilty regarding judgment because it promotes and perpetuates all manner of false criteria for God's judgment. All kinds of nonsense that it promotes and says this is real, this is, this is the way. Forget about Jesus. This is the way that God will determine. You see, the Jews, they insisted Jesus wasn't who He claimed to be. And they denied that belief in Him was essential to be received by God at the judgment. Now, most in our culture would accept that claim. That's right, you don't have to, you don't have to be tied up with Jesus. And they would add against the ancient Jews that all roads lead to God. And some would even deny the very fact of a judgment. Maybe most. So these ideas, you see this notion of of the criteria of judgment. Even those who maintain some kind of accounting before God, the world is lying about it in creating and fabricating all of these false criteria for God's judgment. And the Spirit is sent to do this convicting work because, the, because by the time Jesus ascends, Satan will have been finally and utterly defeated through Christ's atoning death resurrection and ascension the victory will have been won and since that time this creation this reality it exists on the edge of Christ's return and the consummation of the kingdom with Satan's defeat with his condemnation 
a fait accompli. Proclaiming the truth of God's judgment is ever urgent because the Lord may return at any time. So this is what he's talking about, I'm convinced. And I can't help but see the Spirit testifying in this regard. Through the Apostle Paul, when he had the opportunity to speak to Felix and Drusilla in Acts chapter 24, verses 24 and 25. It's not an exact parallel, but it's certainly I see echoes of this in what Paul says. He says, after some days, Felix came with his wife Drusilla, who was Jewish, and he sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. As he reasoned about righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment. Felix was alarmed and said, go away for the present. When I get an opportunity, I'll summon you. You see, I see in that. You think that was an easy situation to preach? You think that was an easy situation to stand boldly, courageously, and tell the truth about who Jesus is when you've got this guy who's got your fate in his hands? It would be so easy to shrink back and say, I'm not going to speak. But Paul, filled with the Spirit, he's preaching. He's telling the truth about Jesus Christ in this world. Now, the Spirit was sent to speak the truth about Jesus in the face of lies and opposition to beckon a lost world to salvation. As the Spirit said through Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, God, our Savior, desires all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Now may we as Christians, as those in whom the Spirit dwells, may we be His faithful instruments in that task. May we stand in the power of the Spirit and speak the truth. If we can help any of you with any need that you have, when we sing this next song, you let that be known and we'll pray for you do whatever we can.